16 Outdated Laws That Royals Use to Their Advantage The British monarchy is steeped in tradition and history dating back centuries. While many of their customs and protocols have evolved over time, there are still quite a few peculiar and rather outdated laws that remain on the books. Laws that grant special rights and privileges exclusively to the reigning monarch. At first glance, some of these archaic laws might seem bizarre or even outrageous in modern times. However, they are a fascinating glimpse into the past and the once widely accepted notion of royal sovereignty and entitlement. From whimsical traditions like the monarch having two official birthdays a year, to more substantive powers like the ability to veto acts of parliament, these outdated laws showcase the unique legal standing and broad autonomy afforded to the British crown. Here's a look at some of the most fascinating outdated laws the royals use to their advantage. Number 1. Ownership of Unmarked Swans One of the most peculiar privileges enjoyed by King Charles is the ownership of all unmarked swans swimming in open waters within the United Kingdom. This law dates back to the 12th century when swans were considered a prized delicacy, reserved for the tables of the aristocracy and royals. In medieval times, the ownership of swans was strictly regulated, with severe penalties for poaching these feathered creatures. While swans are no longer consumed as food today, this archaic law remains in effect, primarily serving conservation efforts to protect the graceful birds and their natural habitats. The annual swan-upping ceremony where swans are counted and assessed for health continues to be a grand tradition upheld by the crown. Number 2. Immunity from Persecution Immunity from Prosecution As the reigning monarch, King Charles is granted sovereign immunity, a centuries-old legal doctrine that essentially makes him immune from prosecution for any criminal acts committed within the United Kingdom. This privilege, rooted in the concept of the divine right of kings, has been a long-held tradition in British law shielding the sovereign from facing criminal charges in their own courts. While this immunity may seem like an extraordinary privilege in the modern era, the monarch is still bound by the conventions of constitutional democracy and is expected to uphold the highest standards of ethical conduct. However, the legal technicality of sovereign immunity remains in place, a remnant of the monarchy's once absolute power. Number 3. No Need for Passports or Driver's Licenses one of the more practical advantages enjoyed by King Charles is the exemption from carrying passports or driver's licenses. All British passports and driving licenses are issued in the name of the reigning monarch, with the famous line, Her, His Britannic Majesty's Secretary of State, printed within. As such, it would be redundant for the king himself to carry these documents as they are effectively issued under his own authority. This exemption extends not only to international travel but also to driving within the United Kingdom a small perk that serves as a reminder of the monarch's unique constitutional position as the head of state. Number 4. Right to Claim Treasure Under the Treasure Act of 1996, the Crown reserves the right to claim certain types of treasure found within the United Kingdom. This includes valuable buried coins, precious metal objects, and other artifacts of historical or archaeological significance. If such a discovery is made by a member of the public, they are legally obligated to report it to the local coroner, who then notifies the relevant authorities. An independent committee then assesses the value and importance of the find, determining if it qualifies as treasure under the Act. If so, the Crown can exercise its right to claim ownership, often paying a reward to the finder or landowner as compensation. This law has its roots in the ancient principle of treasure trove, dating back to the days when the monarch was considered the ultimate owner of all valuable objects found within the kingdom's borders. Today, it serves as a means to preserve Britain's rich cultural heritage and ensure that historically significant artifacts remain in the public domain. Number 5. Ownership of Dolphins and Whales In a quirky legal throwback, a statute from 1324 declares that the monarch owns all fishes royal within a certain distance of the UK shore. This obscure term traditionally includes whales, dolphins, sturgeons, and porpoises found in British waters. The origins of this law can be traced back to a time when these marine creatures were highly prized for their meat, oil, and other valuable resources. By asserting royal ownership, the crown could relegate and profit from their exploitation. While the commercial hunting of these animals is now largely banned, the law technically remains in effect, though its practical implications are limited in the modern era. However, it does provide a basis for the monarch to advocate for the conservation and protection of these magnificent creatures which holds significant cultural and ecological value for the United Kingdom. Number 6. 
no obligation to pay certain taxes. While the late Queen Elizabeth voluntarily began paying income tax and capital gains tax in 1992 to set a good example for the nation, King Charles is technically exempt from these taxes by virtue of his position as the reigning monarch. This tax exemption dates back centuries when the crown was considered the source of all property and wealth within the kingdom. As such, the idea of taxing the monarch on their own income or assets was seen as an inherent contradiction. However, in the spirit of transparency and to align with modern values of accountability, both Queen Elizabeth and now King Charles have chosen to voluntarily pay taxes on their private income from sources like the Duchy of Lancaster. This decision was made to demonstrate that no one, not even the monarch, is truly above the law or exempt from contributing their fair share to the public purse. Number 7. Consent Needed for Laws Impacting Them In a practice known as King's Consent, King Charles must give his explicit approval before Parliament can debate any legislation that could potentially impact the Crown's interests, rights, or properties. This archaic convention has its roots in the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, which holds that the monarch's bound by the laws passed by Parliament. As such, the King's consent serves as a safeguard, ensuring that the legislature does not inadvertently encroach upon the monarch's constitutional prerogatives or personal affairs. While the specifics of this process may seem antiquated, it underscores the delicate balance of power between the Crown and Parliament, reflecting the unique constitutional monarchy that governs the United Kingdom. Number 8. Ownership of the Seabed Through an entity known as the Crown Estate, King Charles technically owns a significant portion of the seabed surrounding the UK mainlands as well as the territorial waters extending up to 12 nautical miles offshore. This ownership stems from ancient laws that established the Crown as the sovereign proprietor of all unclaimed lands and waters within the Kingdom's borders. While the practical implications of this law may seem limited in the modern era, it does grant the Crown Estate the ability to generate revenue from activities like offshore wind farms, tidal energy projects, and other maritime ventures. The profits generated by the Crown Estate are not kept by the monarch for personal use, but rather are surrendered to the Treasury and used for public expenditure, making this an intriguing example of how ancient legal traditions can still have practical applications in the 21st century. Number 9. Two Birthdays In a peculiar tradition dating back to 1748, King Charles is granted the privilege of celebrating two birthdays each year, his actual birthday as well as an official birthday marked by a grand parade and public celebrations. This custom was instituted by King George II, who sought to ensure that the annual Trooping the Color Ceremony, a grand military parade honoring the sovereign's birthday, could be held during the summer months, when the weather was far more favorable for outdoor festivities. As a result, King Charles' official birthday is celebrated on a Saturday in June, typically the second weekend of the month, with a lavish parade known as Trooping the Color held in central London. Meanwhile, his actual birthday on November 14th is usually observed with a more private celebration. Number 10. No Freedom of Information Requests Unlike most public institutions in the United Kingdom, the royal household is exempt from freedom of information requests, a legal provision that allows members of the public to access certain types of information held by government bodies and public authorities. This exemption is rooted in the principle of preserving the privacy and confidentiality of the monarch's official communications, correspondence, and personal affairs. It's argued that subjecting the royal household to public scrutiny through freedom of information requests could undermine the integrity of the constitutional monarchy and the monarch's ability to receive impartial advice and counsel. While this exemption has faced criticism from transparency advocates, it remains in place as a means of upholding the traditional separation between the sovereign and the day-to-day -day operations of the government, reflecting the unique role and status of the monarchy within the UK's constitutional framework. Number 11. Right to Veto Bills While it may seem like a relic of an absolute monarchy, King Charles technically retains the power to veto any bills passed by Parliament, effectively blocking it from becoming law. This constitutional provision, known as the Royal Assent, dates back centuries when the monarch held supreme legislative authority. In modern times, however, the withholding of Royal Assent has become a mere formality, with the last veto exercised in 1708 by Queen Anne. Today, it's widely accepted that the monarch must give their assent to any bill that's been properly passed by both Houses of Parliament in accordance with the principles of parliamentary democracy. Nonetheless, the theoretical right to veto legislation remains enshrined in British constitutional law, 
serving as a symbolic reminder of the crown's historical role in the lawmaking process and the delicate balance of power between the monarch and the elected representatives of the people. Number 12. Pardon Power Among the many ancient powers still vested in King Charles is the royal prerogative of mercy, which grants the monarch the ability to pardon convicted criminals or commute their sentences. This authority rooted in the sovereign's traditional role as the fount of justice within the realm remains a part of British law to this day. While the pardon power is rarely exercised in modern times, it serves as a final safeguard against potential miscarriages of justice or cases where clemency is deemed appropriate. However, the decision to grant a royal pardon is not taken lightly and is typically reserved for exceptional circumstances after careful consideration of all relevant factors. The royal prerogative of mercy operates independently from the judicial system, allowing the monarch to act as a check and balance on the courts and the criminal justice process a vestige of the crown's historical role as the ultimate arbiter of justice within the kingdom. Number 13. Appointment of Bishops As the supreme governor of the Church of England, King Charles plays a significant role in the appointment of high-ranking church officials, including bishops and archbishops. This ecclesiastical authority is rooted in the English reformation of the 16th century when the monarch assumed the role of the head of the newly established Anglican Church. The process of appointing a bishop involves a series of consultations and recommendations, with the Prime Minister ultimately submitting a final candidate to the King for approval. Once approved, the monarch issues a formal letter, known as the Congé de Lire, which grants permission for the candidate to be elected by the respective cathedral chapter. While this process may seem archaic in the modern era of religious pluralism, it reflects the enduring links between the Crown and the Church of England, as well as the monarch's symbolic role as the defender of the faith, a title first bestowed upon King Henry VIII during the tumultuous years of the English Reformation. Number 14. Ownership of Gold Mines The glint of gold has always captivated monarchs, harking back to an era when precious metals were the ultimate symbol of wealth and power. An old Scottish law declares that any gold mines discovered within the borders of Scotland automatically become the property of the crown, and by extension, King Charles III. This arcane statute has its origins in the medieval concept of regalia, which referred to the crown's exclusive rights over certain valuable resources, including gold, silver, and other precious metals. While the practical implications of this law may seem limited in the modern era, it serves as a reminder of the crown's historical claims to mineral wealth and the sovereign's traditional role as the ultimate proprietor of the kingdom's natural resources. Interestingly, this law has been brought into the spotlight in recent years, with the resurgence of gold mining operations in parts of Scotland, sparking debates over the Crown's legal rights and the potential economic benefits that could be derived from these valuable deposits. Number 15. Personal Poet Laureate In a delightfully whimsical tradition, King Charles retains the privilege of appointing a personal poet laureate, whose primary duty is to compose verse for significant royal occasions, such as coronations, weddings, and other momentous events. The position of Poet Laureate dates back to the 17th century, when it was first established by King Charles I as a means of fostering literary patronage and celebrating the art of poetry within the royal court. Over the centuries, the role's been held by some of Britain's most esteemed poets, including William Woodsworth, Alfred Lord Tennyson, and the late Ted Hughes. In addition to the honor of serving as the monarch's personal wordsmith, the Poet Laureate's traditionally rewarded with a modest annual stipend and, in a charming nod to tradition, a butt of sack, a small barrel of sherry. This peculiar perk harks back to the days when such libations were highly prized and served as a form of royal patronage for artists and intellectuals. Number 16. Guardian of Grandchildren Echoing back to an era when monarchs wielded absolute power, King Charles III holds legal custody over his minor grandchildren, rendering him their official guardian in the eyes of the law. While this provision may seem like a relic of a bygone era, it serves as a poignant reminder of the monarch's historical role as the patriarch of the royal family and the symbolic head of the nation. The origins of this law can be traced back to the feudal concept of the crown's ultimate authority over the succession and lineage of the royal bloodline. In a time when dynastic struggles and power plays were common, such legal provisions ensured that the monarch could safeguard the future of the monarchy and protect the interests of royal heirs. In the modern era, however, this law is largely symbolic with the day-to-day -day care and upbringing of royal children falling under the purview of their parents, 
in accordance with contemporary norms and practices. Nonetheless, it remains an intriguing footnote in the annals of British legal history, reflecting the enduring ties between the crown and the perpetuation of the royal family. From being immune to certain parking fines to legally being allowed to eat swans, the royals certainly enjoy some peculiar privileges. But what do you think about these antiquated laws? Are they justified or should they be abolished? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And if you found this video interesting, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family. If you're new here, consider subscribing to our channel for more intriguing videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time with another captivating video. Until next time, bye!